This is a reading of Shipwreck at the Bottom of the World by Jennifer Armstrong. And this chapter is called Pressure. From July 14th through 16th, a blizzard pounded the ship with gale force winds. As the temperature dropped to 34 degrees below zero, the boss ordered the team drivers to feed the dogs a half a pound of lard each day to keep them from freezing. And no man was allowed to leave endurance except to go to Dogtown, where wires were rigged up so the men could grope their way back to the safety of the ship. On board, the men huddled around the stove with their books and their pipes, <clears throat> listening to the wind howl through the stays and the yard arms, and hearing the unmistakable creak of the ship's timbers as ice pressed against the sides of the ship. <clears throat> Shackleton confided, confided in his diary, it would be a relief to be able to make some effort on our own behalf, but we can do nothing until the ice releases our ship. In the meantime, the pressure continues and it's hard to foresee the outcome. For the first time, Shackleton began to voice his doubts about the future of the expedition. In the privacy of his cabin, he and Worsley discussed their dilemma. If the endurance does have to, well, get left behind, we will manage somehow, Worsley said, listening to the howling of the gales outside. We shall hang around as long as we can, the boss replied. It is hard enough on the men as is, without a ship in which to shelter from these blizzards and this continuous cold. He broke off the pace to pace the cabin and nothing more was said for a time. The wind shrieked again and the light flickered in, the, in a draft. When the blizzard subsided, a scene of destruction stretched from one ice white horizon to the other. What had once been a fairly smooth plain was now broken and fractured. Enormous slabs of ice jutted out of the pack at all angles. The wind howled around each mound and, he and hillock and flow, piling up enormous drifts of snow. The garbage dumps had been blown clear of snow and stood out stark and ugly against the white. But worse, the jumble of ice that stretched for hundreds of miles in every direction gave the wind a grip on the ice pack. As the winds built up speed across the tumbling flows, the frozen sea began to shift and creak and press against itself. On the endurance, the ship's timbers began to complain loudly. Mighty blocks of ice gripped between meeting flows rose slowly until they jumped like cherry stones squeezed between finger, thumb and finger, Shackleton wrote. The noise was very loud, like an enormous train with squeaky axles being Shunted with much bumping and clattering, added Worsley. In this picture, <clears throat> it says Hurley, most famous photograph of endurance, looked like a negative, but it isn't. The ship is completely co coated with frost, turning it white, and the winter night is totally black. He took this photograph on the night of August 27, 1915. It required 20 flashes to secure the image on film. Half blinded after the successive flash flashes, I lost my bearings among hammocks, bumping shins against all points and stumbling into deep snowdrifts, said Hurley. And at the bottom, this picture says, one of the weekly gramophone evenings held in the Ritz, the common room of the endurance. <clears throat> Day and night, the men listened to their sturdy ship resist the pressure of the ice. On July 26, the men cheered the return of old Jamaica, sailors slang for the sun, even with its brief appearance raised spirits a little and by August 1st, the pressure on the ship's sides relaxed. The men congratulated one another and praised the ship for withstanding the ice. As August passed in peace and quiet, spirits rose even higher. Spring was on its way. Soon the ship would be free and the journey could continue. All the dogs were brought back on board in case Dogtown was destroyed by shifting ice. 
But at 10 o'clock at night on August 31st, the pressure resumed and the ship began creaking and groaning and trembling like an animal in pain, keeping the men on edge for three days before letting up. September teased them with agonizing on again, off again attacks against the ship. Often it seemed the pressure coincided with their gramophone evenings and some of the more superstitious members of the crew began to think the music caused the pressure. The gramophone was banned to save argument. An increase in plankton in the water drawn from the boreholes around the ship, a sure sign of approaching spring, didn't ward off the suspense that the men now felt. The temperature was rising, the sun was shining longer and longer each day, but endurance wasn't free yet. Worsley noted in his diary on September 22nd, the first day of Antarctic spring, it seemed to be an utterly abandoned by animal life. And it would be hard with the dogs if we do not get a few penguins soon. The dogs were shedding their winter coats, whining and restless to be off the ship again and growing hungrier each day. This is a picture at the bottom of the page that says, as the wind increased, it gained a grip on the broken ice and began driving it relentlessly against the ship. All hands is standing by. We had a slight shock last. There was a noise under the bottom aft, the same as if the ice had broken up. The boss thinks it was a whale, but I think differently, McNesh wrote in his diary. The afternoon of September 30th brought an enormous ice flow bearing down on the ship from the port side. The flow, which Worldsley estimated at possibly a million tons, pressed so hard against endurance that her beams began to buckle and her foremast jerked, shook like a corn stalk in the wind. The attack lasted for an hour, leaving the men stunned. In a daze, they bent to retrieve the objects shaken from their perch, books, tools, charts, pots, pans, boxes of tea and tins of tobacco, microscopes, clocks and diaries, and gaped at the bent and buckled decks. For the next two weeks, the men felt as though they were holding their breath. They hardly dared hope they had seen the last of the pressure attacks. The pack was still drifting steadily northward, carrying the endurance with it. The sun was shining almost around the clock and the temperature had finally climbed above zero. And then on October 18th, a misty gray day, the ice began pressuring in again on both sides of the ship. The ship began to raise to the pressure and it was squeezing it up and out of the ice. Suddenly, endurance rolled over onto its port side, and everything that wasn't nailed down slithered and crashed against the bulk ward. The dogs and men all went head over heels in a mass of howling confusion. Some of the men prepared to jump as the ship leaned onto its side, but endurance came to rest at an angle of 30 degrees to port. The pressure stopped again, and the boss ordered the men to restore order to the jumbled ship. The crew ate dinner that night, propped up against the decks like men seated with, in a grandstand with their plates in their laps. At eight o'clock, the ship suddenly righted itself again and floated free. The endurance had survived another attack. The next day, the men studied the narrow lead of open water they found themselves in. A killer whale surfaced besides the ship, its black sides glistening and its white patches dinged a dirty yellow by algae. The animal paraded alongside them for some time before disappearing again. Everything was in readiness for breaking free of the ice. The engines were fired and the sea watches were set as the crew waited for a sizable lead that would take them out of the ice pack. Members of the crew began to talk about the future and what they would do when they returned home. Reginald James, the physicist, declared that once he got back to Cambridge University, he never wanted to see another scrap of ice for the rest of his life. He wasn't the only one to feel that way. <clears throat> but no navigable leads formed. Days passed and still endurance and her crew waited for readiness. <clears throat> 
To their dismay, the pressure began again on August 24th, and it began so strong, so steady, there could be no doubt the ship was in for it. The crew had seen pressure before, but none of it compared with what they were seeing now. The whole pack, for as far as the eye could see, was churning and heaving and shuddering. Bergs and flows larger than the ships rose up and tumbled over like children's toys. Icebergs plowed through the pack. Dr. Macklin felt he was watching something colossal, something in nature too big to grasp. Endurance was pinned on all sides by this immense upheaval. As flows pressed against her, leaks sprang in the hold. Planks began twisting out of place. Amid the sounds of tortured wolves were the howls and whines of the dogs. In the boiler room, the men took turns manning the pumps to keep the water out, but they knew they were toiling for nothing. In a desperate attempt to keep the pressure off the ship, Shackleton ordered some of the men over the side to hack away at the flows with axes and picks. All night long, they rotated in shifts from the pumps to the axes and back again. And now the boss directed the lifeboat equipment and stores to be transferred onto the ice beside Endurance. On the evening of October 25th, the troop of eight emperor penguins waddled out of the fog and stood looking at the embattled ship. They tipped their heads and began hooting dismally. Although the men had seen emperor penguins before, none of them had ever heard the birds utter a sound. Now that the emperors were wailing at the ship, it sounded to everyone ears like a dirge. Did you hear that? Asked Tom McLeod, one of the sailors. Will none of us get back to our homes again? You won't get home if you stand there gaping, wild snap, get the dogs off. Shackleton turned away and ordered the men to resume their back-breaking futile work. It was a sickening sensation to feel the decks breaking under one's feet, the great beams bending and then snapped with a noise like heavy gunfire, he wrote later in his diary. The ship was being crushed like a nut and Shackleton knew there was nothing he could do to stop it. All that night and the next day, the pressure continued without let up. The stern post was ripped away. The keel was sheared off. The decks had begun buckling. The thick beam snapped like twigs. As water rushed forward, it weighed down the bow. The men pumped with every last shred of their failing strength. But by five o'clock on October 27th, Shackleton told them to stop pumping. It was obvious there was no point going on. The ship could endure no more. In a calm voice, he ordered the men over the side. Wild picked his way carefully over the quaking deck and found William Bakewell and Walter Howe asleep from exhaustion. He shook them awake. She's going, boys. I think it's time to get off. Shackleton had the flag raised one more time on the battered mast, which brought a weary cheer from the men and then began overseeing the evacuation. Um, on this page, the picture has a caption that says the pressure grew stronger, forcing the ship on its side when a massive flow rams against it on October 19th, 1915. We have sprung a leak. I am working all night trying to stop it. The pressure is getting worse, McNash wrote. And with this picture, the caption says, Endurance slowly but surely be being consumed by the ice. McNash's diary continues. Endurance is going to pieces fast. The stern broke posts and then the keel was torn out of her. Then she filled rapidly. So we have at the bottom here, it says, I brought your banjo ashore. Shackleton said to Hussey, look after it. We shall indeed. Then as Ord Lees prepared to abandon the ship, the boss said to him, we've got it in the neck all right this time, haven't we? 
Well, no, orderlies ventured. You wouldn't have had anything to write a book about if it hadn't been for this. By Jove, I'm not sure you are right, Shackleton replied, and the two men left together. And then they went over the side, leaving endurance to die in the grip of the ice.